once again live on uh, the internet with our Wednesday evening Bible study. We have been on a three week break and now we're back. We last The last time we were together, we continued in our study of the book of Romans and I think we went through chapter 10 quite a bit and uh, really talked about how um, the first up until chapter 9 and 10 of Romans, uh, Paul had d discussed all of the doctrinal points that needed to be pointed out to the believers in Rome and to the others in Rome that were listening. And uh, I know that we've gone through it pretty thoroughly because I can't hardly see the words anymore in my Bible. And I've already written on it <laughs> too much. <laughs> so uh, I know I kind of how I keep up with where we are because I haven't written so much on some but not enough. Anyway, so we're, we're, we're going into 10 and 11, and we're dealing with um, really the life of the Christian more so than the doctrine now and, and God's master plan. We all know that there's a master plan in, 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 at play here. We all know that God's plan has been in, uh, in motion since the beginning of time, and uh, this is revelation for the ones who read the book of Romans and the ones who the letter was written to uh, and and so on of how God's plan works and how it uh, affects everybody where John 3.16 can be true for God so loved the world that anybody or all would believe right so this is where the Israelites were having some issues understanding first off that they were even though they were God's chosen people for a chosen purpose that the gospel was also for the Gentiles and that the Gentiles could be saved by grace and, and did not have to convert to the Jewish faith in order to receive that grace. So all of these questions were answered. There was a lot of questions that the Israelite people were asking and challenges uh, uh, toward Paul and his teaching in, ch in chapter 10. If you missed it, it's still on the Facebook page and it's on the YouTube page channel you can go and look at them and kind of go back and do some review if you want to that way I don't have to use up my time to review chapter 10 and we'll go into chapter 11 however um, verse 20 of chapter 10 uh, he, he, he's quoting Isaiah in finishing up his um, argument against Israel's unbelief and why they would why they would not believe he said, he's quoting uh, Isaiah, and he said, I was found, verse 20 of chapter 10, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. It's Isaiah 65. And then verse 21 says, but concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Also, Isaiah 65. Uh, verse 1 and 2 is what those are. Well, um, this is basically a presentation of, yes, the Israelite people were God's chosen people. They refused to fall in line with God. They rejected the gospel. And uh, God is pointing out through uh, Paul's letter here that uh, none of this is outside of God's plan. And none of it is uh, a surprise to God. Right? You ever, you ever wonder from time to time when you think about Jesus and when he was arrested that Judas sold him out for just a small handful of change? And, and, and sometimes I would wonder why Judas? Why does he get to be that guy? If God's master plan, it had to happen. Somebody had to turn Jesus in. Right? I mean, Jesus could have turned himself in, I suppose. But that's not the way God's plan was. So it was Judas. And, of course, sometimes people ask the question, well, does that mean God didn't love Judas? Does that mean the gospel wasn't for Judas? Right? And if you think about it in terms of what the gospel is and, and what it means and how it works, the answer has to be, well, God did love Judas. And Judas, the gospel was for Judas too. That's what repentance is about.
and his opportunity to repent was there, right? So then you look at the Israelite nation, and they're having a tough time understanding how the gospel applies to the Gentiles, and they're having a tough time understanding how God would not save them just because they're Jewish, right? They, they, because they're God's people, so why would they, I mean, they could even go so far as to say, why would we even need some kind of gospel? Because we're God's chosen people. Right? Well, verse 11, or excuse me, chapter 11 and verse 1, let's, let's continue on with those kinds of uh, thoughts and explanations. I asked then, in verse 1, did God reject his people? And, and the reason he's asking this question is because they're discussing why the gospel is available to the Gentiles who were not God's chosen people. Why they are having to uh, move from the workings of the law and move into this grace idea. Why is everything changing if God had already had a plan put in place? So he's saying, did God reject his people? By no means with the exclamation point. He, he's still asking questions that the people are already thinking and have been thinking. He says, I'm an Israelite myself. I, meaning, I don't want the Israelites to be rejected. <laughs> I don't want God to reject the Jewish community because I'm one of them. He says, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2 says, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that what the scripture says in the message about Elijah, how he ap appealed to God against Israel, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your, your altars. I am the only one left, and they are, all, they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then is no longer by works. If it were grace, it would no longer be grace. Excuse me, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. Stop right there. He's talking about uh, something that Elijah was going through in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, where uh, everything broke loose, and he's on the run because people are trying to kill him. And even what seemed like his own people were against him. And he was crying out to God. He's like, I'm the only one left that's faithful. That's what, he, that's what he felt like. Am I the only one that really loves God right now? And God was saying to him, no, there's 7,000 other people, other Israelites that have been faithful to me. You're not the only one. There's a small remnant left. Right? And, and it had to be that way because it's God's plan all along to bring Jesus into the world through the Israelite nation. That's why they're his people. Right? So God's not going to allow his people to just completely fall away to where it foils his plan to bring Jesus into the world. So there's all there. And then, and he's saying even now, in this present time, even though the Israelite nation, the Jewish people, in, in, include, are included in the group of people in the world that sinned against God and sent Jesus to the cross. They were, they were out there just the same as anybody else saying crucify him. But he's saying there, there, are, there are some people that still are faithful to me, right? Notice uh, verse 4. He says, and, 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 and what was God's answer to him? He says, I have reserved myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That was when in Elijah's situation in 1 Kings chapter 19. Meaning the people of God were bowing to uh, some other god. For whatever reason, for whether it was political pressure, whether it was social pressure, whether it was a threat from some king, right? Whatever, the, or just the desire to worship Baal. They turned from God and worshiped another God, right? And now he's saying there are a few, even in, during the time of this writing, who have not turned from me. And they're not bowing to the gods of this day, right? Now, we have to think about this. All right. There's a, there was a remnant. There's always a remnant of God's people who aren't faithful. All right. So that's now.
teaching uh, in, in, on the mountainside and he's talking about the kingdom of God and he teaches about when there's, there's, there's only one way to the Father, right? And that's through me, the Jesus, the Savior. And, and the, way to, the way to everlasting life is uh, a narrow road. Remember he talked about something like that? And he also said, few will find that road and take it. The road to destruction is wide and many will take that. And even in our day today, God's people, those who are saved by his grace, it, it talk, when it talks about Jesus and his, finally his return, what we're all waiting for, when it talks about when God, is, uh, when it, when God says it's all over with and it will be the end of this world as we know it and God will recreate a new world and, and an everlasting life for those who are his, he says there will be few who are saved. Right? Which is what a remnant is. And that's the reason why Jesus, when he was teaching, he said, there's going to be many who call out to me, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I don't even know who you are. Because they never had a relationship with him. They never were genuine in, in their faith. They, it was all just lip service or pretending. Right? Or they just flat out rejected. So this is what we're looking at, and he's saying, so too at the present time, verse 5, is a remnant chosen by what? By grace. Now, remember in chapter 10, we read some things uh, where I pointed out, I think I remember pointing out that uh, this is, there is a, it's easy to misunderstand or be taught something that's not correct as far as uh, God choosing some people to be saved and, and not choosing other people saved and which would be favoritism which is what James, James taught against in the scriptures so you can't have that if you can't have one piece of scripture disagreeing with another piece of scripture and it all be true right so God there's no, we don't teach that God chooses some to be saved and some not to be saved we because that would make John 3 16 to be false right but what we do teach is all who have put their faith in Christ can be saved by God's grace. So when this verse here says at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace, okay, the, the people who are saved are chosen, but they're chosen by grace. And that's how God chooses who is going to be in his presence. Y'all see what I'm saying? He doesn't just look at the the room full of people and say, I'm going to pick you, 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 and you, and then not you and not you. He says, I choose anyone who surrenders to my grace and puts their faith in Christ. That's who I choose. His desire is that it would be everybody. But because God knows the hearts of his creation, he knows it won't be everybody. And if we choose not to believe that Jesus is the Christ, then we inadvertently choose to make God our enemy. And then therefore we would not be chosen by God. Not because he doesn't love us and not because Jesus didn't die for us. It's because we chose to be an enemy of God by not stepping into his grace and rejecting Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what the Israelite people, the Jewish people needed to understand. In the end, in the overall picture, and hopefully if we get through most of 11 today, we can under, maybe have a bigger, a better description of what's going on, that the Israelites are going to be saved by God's grace and only by God's grace. But they're not going to be saved just because they're Israelites. And some of them are falling away because they refuse to accept Christ. They refuse to accept the way of grace. The only way to be the chosen ones is to step into God's grace. So we get to choose whether or not we're chosen or not. That's what free will is all about. right? And that's what a lot of people in the world, even in today's world, don't understand. right? God has done everything he is going to do to solve the sin problem 
ball is always in our court. We always have to choose. We always have to say, okay, I'm either going to submit and accept this truth and let it be who I am, surrender to it, or I'm going to reject it. And one thing we know is that God will never force himself on anybody. Because forced love is not true love. And if we can agree on that point, then we, we have to agree that God would never pick some people and not pick other people without free will being involved in those people. Because that's force. Because some people don't want to be saved. Under that doctrine, if that doctrine were true, and it's not, but some people teach that, then that means that if, if you're chosen to be saved, you're going to be saved whether you want to be saved or not. And if you're not chosen to be saved, you're not going to be saved whether you want to be saved or not. There's no free will in that, and it's all forced. And God's love is not force. God doesn't force himself. That's why it says there's only going to be a remnant. There's only going to be a few. And you're chosen by grace. So God chooses those who are in his grace. Verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. In other words... You can't earn your way in, and you can't buy your way in. God has already done what needs to be done, and he chooses anybody who surrenders to that. Right? So then we go to verse 7. Uh, yeah, verse 7. And then he, then it's going to talk about the hardening of the heart. I'm, I'm trying to take a little bit of time for a couple reasons. One, because we've been on a break for a few weeks, and we just need to kind of ease back into it. But we also, I, I want to slow down because this is something that I think people either skip over a lot or that we don't think about too much. Verse 7 says, what then? Here comes another question. What Israel sought to earnestly, uh, uh, it did not obtain. Excuse me, so earnestly it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened. All right, the elect, referring to verse 5 the ones chosen by grace, the, the remnant. Right? So he says, what Israel sought so earnestly, so they loved God, and they wanted to be God's people, and they wanted to be God's people forever. That's what we all want still today. But they were seeking it in the wrong way. They didn't obtain it. They didn't grasp it because they were trying to work for it. And it says, but the elect did, the ones in verse 5 who are chosen by God's grace. They did receive that. He says, then others were hardened. Others being the ones other than the remnant who were faithful of the Jewish people, the, the Israelites. The ones who stayed faithful were in God's grace. But the ones who weren't remaining faithful, whether they were worshiping other gods or whether they just slacked off on their Jewish duties, or whether they were just playing games. They weren't faithful. And it says that they were hardened. A lot of, a lot of uh, translations, uh, the original, I, I don't know how to pronounce the original words, but they mean more like calloused. Like a callous on your hand means the skin is dead and there's no, there's no more feeling in that portion of your if you don't know what that is like, then come over here and we'll chop wood together for a couple of days and you'll figure it out. I think everybody should have a cow at some point just so they know. But he's talking about the hearts of those who were not in his grace. The hearts of those who were not part of the remnants. And, and every time I hear the Bible talk about someone being hardened, I think of Pharaoh when Moses said, let my people go. And it says God hardened his heart every time. And there's always this big discussion in our Bible studies. Like, why would God harden someone's heart? Why would God do that to somebody? Doesn't God love everybody? And it always comes back to that. If, God is, if it seems like God is doing harm to someone, then God must not love them. But in reality, what's happening is, is this God hardening someone is a response to a person's relationship with with him or direct action toward or away from him. If a person is hardened by God, even today, it's because they are fading away from him and neglecting their relationship with him or rejecting him altogether. And I've, I've said this many times, 
I believe that God will give us the desires of our hearts. Every time. He is faithful in that. And if we don't want him, we won't have him. Because he doesn't force himself on us. And if we desire the things of this world over him, if we desire some other God over him, if we desire for him to leave us alone so that we can be whatever we want to be in our lives, in this world, then he will leave us to that. And it's not because he doesn't love us. It's not because Jesus didn't die for us. It's not because he, he, he wants to see us away from him. It's because we choose not to be with him and he will not force himself upon us because that's not true love that's not real love so he says the others the ones who weren't the remnant were hardened verse 8 it says as it is written God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes so that they could not see and ears so that they could not hear to this very day Talking about uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9. And David says in verse 9, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a rep retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Now, uh, Justin and I have been working on a podcast, and we've been discussing various aspects of spiritual disciplines and how to become healthy spiritually, things that we can do and things that we can focus on that God would use to make us stronger and closer to him and grow spiritually so that we will not become hardened, so that our hearts won't become callous. When, it, when you get a callous, it's hard to have, you could, you could stick yourself with a knife at, if you have a big enough callus and it's been there long enough. You could, you could actually stab yourself a little bit and you wouldn't feel it. It's dead. The skin is dead. All the nerves are dead. It's just dead skin. Well, think about that in a way when your heart gets calloused. And God allows it to just keep getting harder and harder and harder. Then the, the love of God is less noticeable. The presence of God is less noticeable. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is almost non-existent if it gets so bad. Right? Anything that God does has no effect. Not because God's not powerful enough to make it have effect, but because God doesn't force himself. That's why it says God allowed the heart mm -hmm. to get hard. God could stop anybody's heart from getting hard, but that's force, isn't it? God wants us to want to love him, to want to be in his presence, to want to be his people, to want to be part of the remnant of his faithful believers. That's what God wants. Mm -hmm. Now you think, I'm going to pause right here. You think about today's world and all the churches around the world all the churches here in the United States, churches in our community, doesn't matter what denomination, if they're believers, if they believe that Jesus is the Christ and they're living in God's grace, right? That's who I'm talking about. It is very easy for people to just stay home these days, isn't it? Just don't come to church. Don't get involved in Bible studies. Don't go, don't go to do any fellowship. Don't even go out and serve people. In the name of the church or in the name of the, of the kingdom of God. That's very dangerous. Because you, your heart will get hard. The only way to prevent that is to seek the Lord. Tune into your spiritual uh, needs in your life. Prayer, Bible study, service, fellowship, worship, and so on. And no matter what we have to do, we have to serve the Lord. We have to continue to be the church. Because if we don't, our hearts will slowly become hardened. And one day, when we leave this world, we will stand before our Savior and he will say, I don't know who you are. If we allow that to happen. 
And if we're sitting back waiting for God to make something happen, he's already done everything he's going to do. It's up to us to not allow our hearts to get hard by practicing our spiritual growth, our Bible studies, uh, 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 the fellowship that we have with other believers. We can still do all of that in a safe way because of the virus. But do not let the virus become your excuse to stop serving the kingdom of God because your heart will get hard. That's what's happening here. That's what they're being warned against. That's what had happened to them. That's what happened way back in uh, second, uh, First Kings. The, the nation of Israel got away from God, and there was just a few, 7,000 that were faithful, and God took those faithful and moved on with his plan. And the rest, they didn't get to be a part of it. Not because God doesn't love them, because they didn't love God. The truth is true then, and it's still true today. So then we go into verse 11. He says, again, I ask, did they stumble, talking about the, uh, the believers, the, the Jewish community, as, so as to fall beyond recovery? That's a good question. What, what happens when a person does fall away from the church or fall away from God or fall away from their faith? Right? And he says, not at all. Rather, because their transgressions, that's another word for sins, Salvation has come to, to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Remember, if we remember all the way back in the first few chapters here in Romans, right? Three, first three and four chapters, one, two, three, and four. They said, because the Israelite nation rejected Christ, then okay, let's offer it to the Gentiles. Right? Mm -hmm. So... Focusing again on John 3, 16, if, that ha if that's absolute truth, if it's absolute truth, then the gospel message, salvation, has to be for every person who puts their faith in Christ. Jewish or Gentile. Right? So what happens if a person does start to fall away from God and they do seem to be getting their hearts a little hard and their response to the Christian brothers and sisters loving them and encouraging them and inviting them to the fellowship and the service and the worship and all of that. What happens to them? Are they just lost forever? And he says no. No. That's the reason why the Gentiles are getting saved so that the Jews can look and say oh, they're... you ever seen little kids when one kid gets something and the other one doesn't? It's like a fight in the house. Well, how come they get that? We don't, how you didn't give me nothing? Or if you give two bowls of ice cream and one of them's got three scoops and the other's got two, you got problems, don't you? Because it's not fair. Because that's the human nature. And in Jewish communities, they're saying, and you know, if you look at church discipline as well, if anybody who studied what the Bible says about church discipline, if, if a person ever gets to the point where they're asked to leave a church because they're just so disruptive and won't repent and won't stop being disruptive, and they're finally asked to leave the church, it's for the purpose that they would realize that they're messing up and that they would repent and come back. This is the same thing. Right? God's not running anybody off. He's just making everything crystal clear so that the choices, the free will that we all have, we have no excuse when we stand before God. We can't say, oh, I didn't know it was about all that. I didn't realize this. No, we, should, we will know. Right? He says salvation has come to Gentiles that make, the, the Israels, that make Israel envious. Verse 12 says, but if their transgressions means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? So, he's, so don't, get, don't get all lost here. He's just basically saying that if, if the sins of the Israelites God can use for the greatness of saving souls in the Gentile community and change the world, turn the world upside down that way, how much greater will it be when they finally do repent and they too can be saved? 
And the whole world has changed. And when Jesus comes back and we're all in the presence of God. So he's basically revealing in verses 11 and 12. He's saying, look, we're talking about something bigger than the Israelite nation. Bigger than the Gentiles. We're talking about God and his master plan. Which he's saying, because the Israelites had sinned and rejected Christ this way and fallen away from God being their God, God will use that to bring others close to him, even though it's not what he desires. There is nothing that happens in this world that is out of God's control. There is nothing that happens in this world that is a surprise to God. There's nothing that happens in this world that isn't part of God's plan. Right? The only thing, the only variable that exists in God's plan is man's free will. That's the only thing that can change anything. Because God's plan is that Jesus dies on the cross and is resurrected from the dead and goes to be back with the Father so that whoever puts their faith in him as Lord and Savior, can live in his grace and be saved for eternity. And the only thing that changes is a person's free will. The plan is the same. The plan never changes. But the only variable is whether or not I choose yes to Jesus or no to Jesus. Whether I choose grace or, or, or reject grace. So anybody, anybody that ask you a question, why does God allow people to go to hell, or why does God send some people to hell and, and allow some people to go to be in heaven? And God didn't allow, didn't send anybody to hell. The only people who go to hell are the people that choose to go there. Because God sent Jesus to die for everybody so they could all be with him. <coughs> but he also knows that not all will say yes. Because his love is perfect, he will not force it on those who don't want it. So he allows their hearts to harden. Right? That doesn't mean we don't chase after them and try to keep sharing the gospel with them and keep loving them with God's love until the day that they die. Because as long as a person has breath in their lungs and has their right mind, they can choose yes or no. And they're the only ones that can break through a hardening heart. I'm the only one, if my heart is getting hard, I'm the only one that can break through that. Let me, let me say that different. I'm the only one that's going to be able to break through that. God can break through that, but won't. Because he doesn't force himself. If you don't want him, he's not going to make you. If he wants you to want him, he wants you, but he's not going to make you want him. All right. Next week. Since it's 8 o'clock, next week we're going to start at verse 11. We're going to try to finish up because he's going to continue on with the thought about the grafted branches, engrafted branches. And he's going to also talk about, go back to the Israelites who had rejected him and say, they, they can be saved. They're not totally lost. All right? But because uh, Israel had fallen away, God used it to bring the Gentiles to salvation. And, and by the way, uh, verse 11 through 20, uh, uh, 24 next week, he's going to he's going to talk about the purpose of Israel's uh, transgressions, and he's also going to give a warning to the to the to the Gentiles. All right. Basically, he's going to say to the Gentiles, just because you have received grace and you're grafted into the tree doesn't mean you're special. doesn't mean you're better off than the, the Israelites that were sinners. Because the only way you could be grafted into the tree of life is if something got cut off of it. So, think about it that way. Gentiles. Alright. That's all I got for today. I, I kind of went slow, but that's alright. because This is kind of important. This is a good section of Romans for us to kind of look at today. Uh, main focus we had tonight was hard hearts and how they get to be hard and how to deal with that. It's kind of like Play-Doh. It starts to get hard and you can save it if you get it in time. 
but after a while it gets so hard you can't save it. Right. I love you and the Lord loves you. See you.